Good morning. We'd like to welcome you to our Sunday morning service for July the 17th, 2022, here at First Baptist Church Holka. Uh, a couple of things to keep in mind. Don't forget about our offering needs each week. If you are here with us this morning, the offering plates are in the foyer and here down front. If you're joining us on Facebook Live or on the YouTube recast, you may bring offerings by 504 Griffin Avenue or mail them in to P.O. Box 205. Um, some off, some off opportunities for offering right now. Our school box, our, our shoe box items this month will be school supplies. There are cards down front with supply ideas, or you may reach out to the church office if you are joining us at, at another location and want to know what's going on. Uh, you can find out what you can give for Operation Christmas Child. Our audiovisual fund is always in need of money. We are working toward upgrading our AV equipment. Wednesday, July the 20th, that's this week, the Young at Heart are meeting in the Family Life Center at 11 o'clock. You all are eating red, white, and blue foods for July the 20th, Young at Heart meeting. July the 24th will be our Deacons meeting Sunday morning at 7.30 a.m. And then that afternoon will be a church-wide fellowship. I believe that is Finger Foods at 4.30. And our revival begins that night at 6 o'clock. July 25th through 27th, Monday through Wednesday nights, our revival will begin at 7 p.m. each night. And I think if you look at Facebook, there is a flyer on Facebook, and there are also flyers around town. Brother Ken Hester from First Baptist Church, Pontotoc is going to be joining us for our revival. And I believe that's all as far as the announcements go this week, other than whatever Brother Patrick has to tell you in a few minutes. Right now, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I ask you to be with us this morning as we worship you together, Lord. We ask you to be with our hearts and minds as he brings the word to us, Lord, that the words of the songs touch us. And Lord, let us be empowered for your service. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, our children will head out to Children's Church with Mr. Tommy. And our call to worship today is praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Praise to the Lord. Multiply to me, and I heard it so clearly. 
this time I'll invite you to stand as we continue singing with Lion of Judah, Calvary's Lamb.
thank you for that, Miss Melinda. Uh, for our members who are present here this morning, you should have received a deacon election ballot. If you did not get one of those ballots, please uh, let us know where we can get you a copy of that. And uh, at the end of the service today, we're going to ask you to vote for two people, two men, to fill the positions of deacon and also active deacons. If you will hang around after the service to help get those collected and counted so that we can get that taken care of today. We would appreciate that as well. Also, as Miss Melinda was talking about, our upcoming uh, revival meeting starting next Sunday night, and the uh, information was put on our church Facebook page last night, but I'll remind you of what was put on there last night in case you uh, don't have Facebook or haven't seen what was put on Facebook last night. We are going to have a church-wide fellowship next Sunday afternoon at 430 we're asking you to bring snacks, finger foods, drinks, and hopefully some homemade ice cream, I think has been hinted at. If anybody feels like bringing that and we'll give you a time to fellowship together as a church family and meet Brother Ken and uh, get to know him a little bit before the service begins Sunday night. And then Monday night through Wednesday night, we'll be eating at 530 for those who are going to help provide meals on Monday and Tuesday night. And then we're going to have youth night. Wednesday night at 5.30 and Brother Ken will get to meet the youth and eat pizza with them. So uh, that's how that's shaping up and lining up for next week. And so we encourage you to come out and be a part of those uh, services if you can. And definitely be in prayer for our upcoming revival meeting. This morning we are going to be in Hosea chapter 12 as we look at the 14 verses that make up Hosea chapter 12. We are seeing that Hosea is continue, continuing to talk to the nation of Israel about the upcoming discipline that they are going to face. And this is discipline due to rebellion. We have talked about this uh, as we've gone throughout this book and looked at each one of these chapters and broken this down. How the nation had forsaken its covenant with God. The nation had forsaken its uh, responsibilities to God. It was no, he, the nation was no longer living for God. He was no longer the center of their universe. That's what we have to understand is we are to be in the center of God's, wills, uh, of God's will as Christians. And we are to honor him. We are to glorify him. We are to magnify him. In all that we do, and we, we also are totally dependent upon him. We totally rely on him. He provides everything that we need. He provides the strength. He provides our food. He provides everything that sustains us and helps us to live victoriously and walk as Christians. And what the nation of Israel had somehow forgotten in their history and in this time period that they were in was that it was God who had delivered them out of Egyptian bondage. It was God who had helped them to walk across the Red Sea on dry land. It was God who had provided for them 40 years while they wandered around in the wilderness because of their disobedience. It was God who had watched out for them, protected them, taken care of them. And not these political alliances that they had made, not the prosperity that they thought that they had built up on their own, and not anything that they could rely on other than God. And so what we're going to notice this morning in these verses is that this is a picture of God as a loving parent sending discipline to his children in order to perfect their character and build their endurance. That's what God wants for us. That's why he sent his son to die on the cross for us so that we could surrender our lives to Christ so that we could be adopted in the family of God, become joint heirs with Jesus Christ so that he could perfect our character and build our endurance so that we can run the race and finish the race well. And what we may be experiencing this morning, what you may be experiencing this morning is that at some point you have gotten out of line with God. You had surrendered your life to Christ. You had 
entered into a relationship with Christ, you would enter into that relationship and you were on fire for God and you were being discipled. You were involved in the activities of the church as far as Bible study goes and Sunday school goes and discipleship training whenever we had that available and all these different things that were available to you to help you to grow, to help you to mature, to help you to progress in your walk with Christ. But at some point, you got away from that. And you began to see that your character wasn't where it needed to be and you weren't able to endure like you once did. What we see here is that God wants you to come back in line. He wants to get you back where he would have you to be. And in order to do that, he may send discipline to us from time to time. Hosea is trying to get the nation of Israel to see here that God is love. God loves us. God has always loved us. There's nothing that we can do to make him love us less. And there's nothing that we've ever done that would make him love us more. He is love and his love is perfect. And so for you to try to use the excuse, well, uh, you just don't know what I've done. There's no way that God can love me. You must have left out that verse in your Bible that says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that whosoever was you, that whosoever is me. And what the nation of Israel needed to understand and what the Pharisees and Sadducees and Jesus' day needed to understand, there was no religious tradition that was going to cause God to love them anymore. It didn't matter how many times they offered sacrifices or how long they prayed in public or any of those things that they did, their hearts were far from God. And we see here in Hosea chapter 12 a nation whose heart was far from God. That may be you this morning as a Christian. Your heart may be far from God. It may be this morning you're here and you have never surrendered your life to Christ. Today is the day of salvation. That's why we have been promoting this meeting that is coming up and these services that are coming up and Brother Ken coming to bring the messages. But what we have to understand is that Brother Kim will be bringing revival. If revival comes, it will come from God. It is God who wants to revive. It is God who wants to redeem. It is God who wants to do a work in our midst. The question we have to ask ourselves, are we going to move out of the way where God can work? Are we going to move out of the way where God can move? Where he can make an impact, where he can make a difference, where he can revive hearts so he gets the glory for it, so that he gets the honor for it, so that he gets the credit for it. He wants to perfect our character. He wants to build our endurance. And that comes from us spending time in his presence. That comes from us spending time in his word, studying and praying over and meditating upon it. And so I want us to jump into these verses now in Hosea chapter 12 and see, first of all, in verse 1, the present need for discipline. Here's what was going on. Ephraim, which we talked about, is the name that Hosea used quite often in this book for Israel, feedeth on wind and follows after the east wind. He daily increases lies and desolation, and they do make a covenant with the Assyrians, and oil is carried in to Egypt. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you now. We do pray this morning that you would help us to gain wisdom, insight, instruction from your word today. Lord, we pray for just a little while this morning that we would be attentive to the word and that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts through your word as it always does if we will allow it. And dear Lord, that you will transform our lives here today. And if there is someone here who doesn't know you as Savior and Lord of their life, that they would surrender all before it is too late. And Lord, if there is someone here who is out of fellowship with you, needs to come home, needs to return, needs to repent, that they would do so as well. And Lord, we pray all these things now. Jesus name. Amen. It's a, <clears throat> a pretty 
uh, funny picture if we stand back and look here at verse 1 of Hosea chapter 12 and what Hosea is saying to the nation of Israel and what he is, picture he is presenting to us who are reading this now. He was letting the people know you're feeding on wind. You're feeding on wind. That word feed there literally means to graze. These were the called out ones. They had been called out of Egypt, right? They had been made into a nation and they were to be a holy people, a peculiar people, a people after God's own heart, a people who were worshiping God, magnifying God, living for God, on fire for God, being uh, seen uh, differently in how they conducted themselves and all those things. Now think about this word graze and think about the nation of Israel being the sheep of God's pasture. If you were to go by a farm where there were sheep and there were green grass all around, do you think that those sheep would actually be gnawing at the air or do you think they'd have their head down in the grass getting the nutrients that they needed and the fiber that they needed, everything they needed to sustain themselves and to grow and to have energy to continue to walk. Well, what we see here is that the nation of Israel had been provided everything by God that they needed to be a successful nation, to be a nation that grow, that was growing, that was prospering, that was getting all of their necessary things from God and recognized where their necessary things came from. That's who they should have been, but what they were doing because of the political alliances they had made and the fact that they had now begun to rely totally and wholly upon themselves is basically like they were feeding on the wind. They had green grass all around them that they could graze in and they were gnawing at the air. Now, if you're hungry, you're not just going to gnaw at air, are you? It's not going to sustain you. It's not going to help you to grow. It's not going to have any value at all in your life. And that's what is being exposed with the nation of Israel. There was nothing in their lives of value as far as the spiritual realm went. They had totally forsaken God. They were grazing in the wind and they were reaping the whirlwind as we've already seen previously in this book. It says they were following after the east wind. Their sins were they were worshiping idols. They had made unholy political alliances. They thought as long as they were trading with the Assyrians and that they were giving the Assyrians what they wanted, that the Assyrians would basically keep anybody else from invading their territory and coming into their space. And what they would soon realize is it was the Assyrians themselves that were going to come in and invade their space and take over their territory and completely plunder their nation. The east wind here is still a wind that is talked about today. And this east wind in that part of the world parches the ground. It completely burns up everything. It dries everything out. It is seen as a wasting wind and a wind that can cause severe injury to not only individuals but to crops and to the land. Hosea was giving one last warning here by God in chapter 12 and saying, you're feeding on wind. You're following after the east wind. These idols will not be able to save you. These idols will not be able to hear your cries and your pleas for protection and deliverance. And the Assyrians are not going to show any mercy. God had been showing mercy up to this point. God had been giving them mercy up to this point. But how much longer would that last? When you get to verses 2 through 6, not only do we see this present need for discipline, and we need to understand that it is foolish to think that Assyria was more powerful or dependable than the Lord, and that's what the nation of Israel was doing, but 
Then Hosea gives them a past example of discipline in verses 2 through 6. He's going to reach back in the history of the nation and he's going to call to mind something that the nation of Israel would be very familiar with. And if we go back into the book of Genesis, we can read about this as well. The Lord had also a controversy with Judah. So he's not just addressing the northern, but also the southern kingdom in all of this. And will punish Jacob according to his ways. Now we know that Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And we know that there was a time period in Jacob's life where he was a trickster, right? He was a deceiver. He was the one that would be your friend in front of you and stab you in the back the next time he had opportunity to. That's who he was. He was always that way. Even in the womb, he grabbed Esau's heel and tried to pull him back in. There was all these things that were going on, and so that's who made up Jacob. That's who Jacob was at one point in his life. And so Hosea said, I will punish Jacob according to his ways, according to his doings, will he recompense him. We know what took place in the life of Jacob before he had that encounter with God and wrestled with God all night and had his name changed to Israel. Jacob deceived his brother. He deceived his father. He was a trickster. He was uh, double-minded in all of his ways. And eventually it caught up to him right whenever he thought he was working for one of Laban's daughters and wound up working for another one of Laban's daughters and then had to work another week to marry the other daughter. And we know what all happened there if you go back and read in Genesis. And so the trickster found himself being tricked by Laban. And then not only that, but he had that time period where he wanted to go back home, but he didn't know how Esau was going to react. He thought, if I go back home after everything I've done, Esau is going to kill me. Esau is going to take me out. There's no way that he'll ever forgive me. There's no way that he'll ever forget what I had done to him. Of course, we know they had the reunion there, but Jacob has that all-night encounter with God. When you get to verse 3, we get the picture there. He took his brother by the heel in the womb, and by his strength he had power with God. Yea, he had power in verse 4. This is where I'm wanting to get to with that encounter. The angel there was actually a Christophany or a theophany. It was a pre-incarnate uh, appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. He wrestled with him all and Hosea said he had power over the angel and prevailed. <clears throat> now, if you go back and read in Genesis, about chapter 25 and then chapter 32, and you see all this that happened in the life of Jacob, you're going to notice that he wrestled all night with God. And it says there that he prevailed. But you want to know how he prevailed? You want to know what Hosea is really saying there when he said that he prevailed with God after he wrestled with him all night? He prevailed when he finally surrendered. He said, I'm not going to let go until you bless me. And God touched the hollow of his thigh, right? And whenever he finally surrendered to God, God let him go. That's when he prevailed. And he wept and made supplication unto him. He was crying out to God that God would bless him. And it wasn't until he surrendered to God that he truly experienced the blessings of God. And what Hosea is trying to get the nation of Israel to see here is that they truly want to experience the blessings of God. They're going to have to surrender to him again. They're going to have to return back. They're going to have to repent. It is the only way. What we see in our world today is that there are those who continue to want to tell us that there has to be more than one way to make it to heaven, that we're all on the same road and on the same path and we're all going to the same place, but that's not what the Bible says. And Hosea is letting the nation of Israel know this is what you have to do. You have to be like Jacob. You have to surrender. You have to totally surrender. You have to turn around. You have to come back. 
You have to repent. You have to admit that you have messed up. God still loved them. God wanted to provide for them. God wanted to bless them. God wanted to use them to proclaim his name to the world. But they had to repent. They had to return. He goes on in verse 4. He found him in Bethel and there he spake with us. Even the Lord God of hosts, the Lord is his memorial. Therefore turn thou to thy God, keep mercy and judgment, and wait on thy God continually. I always think about that story there in Genesis with Jacob and how he struggled with God, how he wrestled with God. It was pointed out that before that, Jacob struggled with himself. Jacob struggled with others, and then he struggled with the Lord until he surrendered to God at Jabbok. He never really walked by faith up until that point. It was after that point that from that moment on, his name was changed to Israel, and he walked by faith. And by the way, the rest of his life, he walked with a limp. But anytime somebody saw him and asked him why he was limping, he had a story to tell. He had a testimony. I'm limping because I wrestled all night with God, and I finally surrendered. And you can surrender too. It's not too late. God had to discipline Jacob. He had to get him to where he needed him to be, where he wanted him to be. He had to get him to that place of surrender. Alexander White says the victorious Christian life is a series of new beginnings. And that's what we see with Jacob. And what we see in Hosea chapter 12 is that that's where Israel needed to get to. They needed to get to the place where they understood that the discipline that they were going to encounter was trying to get them where God wanted them to be. To the place of surrender where he could perfect his char their character and build their endurance. He was a loving parent. And ultimately, Israel should have seen that God wanted to help them return. But they refused to listen to Hosea. They refused to listen to the message that God was sending to them. And <clears throat> this shows us from what we've seen so far that we must trust on the Lord to help us return. Israel couldn't return on their own. It was God who was appealing to them. It was God who was dry, trying to draw them. It was God who was working. Are you praying for someone that the Holy Spirit would draw them? That the Holy Spirit would bring them to the point of surrender? That's what we need to be doing here. This is where we're at. This reveals to us how weak we are and how much we really depend on God. The nation of Israel had gotten to the point they thought they didn't need God anymore. They could do it on their own. They weren't depending on him. They weren't listening to him. They didn't care about what he or his prophets had to say. And so because of this present need for discipline exposed and a past example of discipline given, we see the third thing this morning in verses 7 through 14 as we look at God being the heavenly father, the parents' reason for discipline. <clears throat> there were times whenever we were growing up, we got disciplined and we may not have gotten a reason for why we got disciplined. We just got thrashed because we deserved it, honestly, but we weren't given a reason why we deserved it. But there were other times where we got discipline, where we received discipline. And before we received that discipline, mama or daddy or grandma or granddaddy, whoever it was that was doing the disciplining at that time, gave us the reason for the discipline. Well, that's what we see here in the rest of these verses. God, through Hosea, is letting them know, here's why you're about to be disciplined. Here's why you're going to receive the chastening. He said, he is a merchant. 
The balances of the seat are in his hand. These are things that had already been pointed out, but finally Hosea said, here it is. We're just going to lay it all out once again so you know. They were deceitful in their business practices. The higher ups in society were oppressing those who were not as well off in society. He goes on in verse 8 and he said, And Ephraim said, Yet I am become rich. Not once were they acknowledging God for any of the blessings that he had given them. They didn't become rich on their own. It is God who had given them the health to work. It is God who had given them the ability to work. It was God who had provided the crops. And it was God who had provided all of these things. He said, in all my labors, they shall find none iniquity in me that were sin. They didn't even acknowledge that they were sinners or that they needed to repent. In verse 9, he said, and I am that, I that am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt, will you make thee to dwell in tabernacles in the days of the solemn feasts. God is letting the nation of Israel know here, you will, would normally... One week out of the year, observe the Feast of Tabernacles and you would dwell in tents and it would be a celebration and a reminder of what God had done for the nation of Israel during their period of bondage and then their deliverance and then their wandering in the wilderness. It's a picture of all those things. He said, but here's the thing. No longer are you going to be dwelling in tents just as a feast. You're going to have to dwell in tents because you won't have a house to live in anymore. And you won't have a place to call home. You're going to be in bondage in Assyria. In verse 10 he said, I've also spoken by the prophets and I've multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. God said, it's not like I just and didn't let you know what was going to happen. I've been telling you. I've sent Hosea. I've sent all these other prophets. You've been hearing the message. You have been getting what you needed to get so that you could return and repent. And I've been trying to draw you back and you won't come back. And so I'm fixing to take my belt off. The time for discipline is here. Is there iniquity in Gilead? Yes. They sacrifice bullocks in Gilgal. Yeah, their altars or as heaps in the furrows of the fields. And Jacob fled into the country of Syria. And Israel served for a wife. And a wife he kept sheep. And by a prophet the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt. And by a prophet was he preserved. Ephraim provoked him to anger most bitterly. Therefore shall he leave his blood upon him. And his reproach shall his Lord return unto him. So Hosea lays it out. Here's what God has been telling you. Here is why God has sent me and sent other prophets that you have refused to listen to and adhere to their message and allow God to draw you back. And so these are the reasons why you will face discipline. So let's close this way this morning. We know why God disciplined the nation of Israel and why he had to do what he did. We also today know that the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. But it also goes on and says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. God sent his only begotten son because he is love and he loved you enough and he loved me enough to be willing to send his son to take my punishment. I deserve to have that crown of thorns placed upon my head and beat into my skull. I deserve to be scourged by the Roman soldiers before I ever got to that point. I'm the one who deserved to be placed upon the cross and have those spikes nailed into my wrist and into my feet. But it was God, out of his love and his mercy and his grace, that sent his son to take my place and pay my debt. So that I don't have to face punishment for all eternity. So that I don't have to spend eternity separated from God in a place of torment. And it is because of that that we should desire as Christians 
to allow God to perfect our character and build our endurance so that we can run the race and so that we can finish the race and we can disciple others along the way to run alongside us. Are you sharing the gospel? Are you evangelizing your Jerusalem? Are we making a difference? Are we making an impact for Christ? Let's pray. Lord, we come to you.